Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see such a full room and be back again this year. I think this might be my third time at this wonderful conference. So congratulations, everybody, on getting together. And I would say also a big thank you from us uh, for you and your uh, support network, what you did for the Syrian Initiative. I just want to give you a big, big ups for that. <clears throat> So I'm here to talk to you today a little bit for the next half hour or so and would we'll definitely entertain some questions at the end and discussion about what we're finding at the early preliminary stage from our LIPS uh, program evaluation, which is a bigger part of the settlement program evaluation that's currently underway, but not quite yet finished. We wanted to get these findings to you. So many of you helped us so far. We're in the field. We reached out to a lot of you, and we appreciate your input. So I think it's really good to share this with you. I would like to hear your reflections. I think we do have, we have captured effectively a lot of what uh, you're experiencing and generalized at the federal level. And it's really led us to some great findings, which we, we, we can share and, and stand behind, I think. So there you see a little bit of our outline. Just a reminder in terms of the, the context of this, as I said, it's, it's a piece of a bigger evaluation. So as you know, the settlement program, $600 million in funding, big grants and contributions for the department, our big ticket program. This is one little piece of it, and we're dissecting that program in different ways, looking at support services, looking at client outcomes. And I have a little update on that evaluation at, at the very end for information. When we were looking at LIPS and the outcomes and what have we achieved and what can we report to date, our focus really was on some of the key results questions like the level of stakeholder engagement that's been able to be achieved to date, uh, how are we doing with strategic planning relatively, <clears throat> what are the impacts on client service and what can we tell there, and also looking at the relevance and the continued need and, and where to go from here. So we've got findings both positive and some opportunities as well that we think. And I would also let you know that we have shared these findings internally in the department and they're already taking hold of them and figuring out a way forward. It is very early stages and it's a work in progress, but the department is really keyed into this already. And you know, partnerships, place-based settlement services, LIPS, RIFs are all uh, very key on the minister's mind and senior management's mind. <clears throat> I would note, though, for especially for our, our RIFS folks, that we are doing a very similar mini evaluation of uh, Les Réseaux as part of a different evaluation, so it's on a slightly different time track, but that'll be part of our official languages minorities, my, the official language minority communities initiative evaluation, the OLMC's evaluation, but we will have findings on Les Réseaux on the RIFS as well to present to you later down the road or share in some way. So taking a moment here to look at the methodology, and I did want to pause to highlight this because we do feel it's pretty comprehensive and it's let us land on some findings that we can stand behind that are quite solid. As you'd expect, we've done a series of key interviews, a small number, but important ones, largely at NHQ and with IRCC staff. Uh, an in-depth analysis of those performance reports that, that you all love to complete, no doubt. Um, extensive document review. And one of the cornerstones of our evaluation was a coordinator survey. <clears throat> and you can see there, we sent it out to everybody and had a, a tremendous response rate. So I, I thank you again for your input there. That is really where the most valuable, rich information came. And of course, uh, we were visited, you were visited by us at nine locations. You might recall last year we had talked about our sampling on that. And we got a great cross section, I would say, of small centers, more mature LIPS versus newer ones, uh, different governance models, really to give us that sense of how they are at their different stages. And these are the ones we picked. By no means exhaustive, but I think it, it was a good snapshot. So, you know, thanks to those who welcomed us and provided information. And you mix that together, I think we were able to really come up with some, some, some great things that I, I'll share with you in a moment. I do want to note limitations. As a good researcher, there are some context you have to put around the findings, and there were some gaps in information. So, you know, there's certain points we had to use some caution, missing data from those partnership reports. Financial data was, was iffy on the department side in some years. And of course, I think the biggest challenge, and someone just mentioned it momentarily, uh, moments ago, that, you know, we don't, LIPS don't serve clients directly, so attributing an impact ultimately to a client is, I think, what one of the achievements should be of, of a place-based partnership. That's hard to do, and somebody walks in, they can't tell you, yes, I, I got what I needed because of a LIP, but we tried to do some counterfactual work and, and come up with some ideas on that. So I, I won't bore you with a profile. I think uh, you know what you're all about, but a couple of interesting pie charts just to present. Maybe you haven't seen this cutting across your, your sector. Um, Historically, you know, LIPS created starting in Ontario many years ago. We're up to 66 at last count that I'm aware of. 
and, and most of them are housed in a municipal, regional uh, government or settlement service provider is the lead. And those nice pie charts show you a couple different ways to look at this. You can see uh, on one side, about half you would consider a newer LIP, so since developed, established since 2014. And on the other side, who are the lead organizations? So maybe just giving you a flavor of, of what some of the profile looks like there. And if we jump right into the findings, let's get, let's get to the crunchy stuff. Uh, one of the key expected results or achievements of ALIP was you know, the ability to engage a diversity of partnerships to help with service delivery. And what we found here that overall this has been a very successful outcome for LIPS by and large. Uh, they've been able, you have been able to, uh, this is going to be weird, uh, you've been able to engage the right people the, the right partners to a high degree, and we're presenting some statistics there for you. You can see that almost every LIP has had a council or some kind of governance structure established, very important in terms of administratively getting off the ground and setting yourselves up for success. All LIP councils or the working groups had a service provider, mainstream organizations and municipal regional representatives, also key. But I think it's really, really successful to, to note those sub-bullets, seeing who else is involved. 85% of the LIPs included an employment body or an employer organization of some kind. That's huge, as you know, that employment is one of the key areas of integration and you know, immigrant needs, newcomer needs. Uh, you know, many, many had research associations or umbrellas to help them build up that capacity and that knowledge base, which was great. Some of them involved media partners, also an interesting angle. So altogether, the coverage and, and weaving together those who need to be involved was, was an overwhelming success. One of the challenges we did hear from our, our field work was that it was sometimes difficult to engage on the employer side, uh, getting those people on board would take time for various reasons to, to really join up. And also, we heard quite a bit that the level of engagement or participation could vary. Some councils were very active and partnerships were really involved, and others were very broad with maybe an overwhelming number of partners and it was hard to move forward in a consensus approach. So there's a variety here, and I think that's the takeaway. But as a starting block, to have the right people at the table in your council, big success, and we substantiate that through what we found. Another important role, I think, uh, that has been achieved nicely is the research one. That, and we've been able to demonstrate that LIPS have had a major success in generating research and pushing those research agendas, building your evidence base towards results and understanding what's happening in those communities. Uh, again, some statistics are presented and I, I won't bore you with every one and every slide. It's, it's there for you to absorb and, and take away. But you can see that research had been conducted in a huge percent of the cases, uh, and I think that's a great success as a researcher and evaluator. I like to hear that. And you can see that the coordinators reported to us that most felt uh, it was had a, research had a strong or moderate impact uh, there. And many have partnered with some organization, as I said earlier, with universities. Uh, an example, uh, Greater Victoria partners with UVic, we heard, and there are many more out there that have really been, really been able to connect with somebody to build up that capacity, so that is, that is great stuff. And even, you know, kudos to those who've been able to push their research agenda without uh, additional support or funding, so, you know, that shows the importance of it to, to a LIP. A little graphic here on showing the degree of strategic plan uh, development and implementation, so it's part of the requirement of developing and setting up a LIP, and we were able to see that most of them had established a strategic plan and felt that they were very useful to do as a roadmap, as a guide. Uh, but implementation was taking a little bit longer, so achieving some of the activities that were built in that plan were maybe not fully where, fully there yet. But I would argue that if you look at the graph, it, it's a reflection of the fact that not every lip was as mature enough to make some of these things happen yet for various reasons. So I don't look at that as a, as a, as a big negative. I think it's just a reflection of implementation and getting off the ground. Nonetheless, well on the way towards establishing and putting into place some of the parts of those, those plans. When you think about findings around uh, strategic plan development, something that came up as a bit of a challenge for the, the, the collective was the absence of specific project funding, having to do things you know, more with less, if you will, that, that makes it difficult. And that was reported to us quite a bit. So on, on the plus side, you can see, we've cited just a few examples, not to single a few folks out, that they've done a lot of good things in terms of special projects that have contributed to the, the LIP and the environment and the integration and whatnot. You see mapping and so forth, community activities. It, it's all flavors and stripes, so that, that's really just a little a cut for you there. 
Uh, we do note, of course, and the department here is loud and clear, that there's funding for the coordinator role typically. That's where most of the IRC funding goes. And I, I think last year we had funded to the tune of about $10.2 million across the LIPS. So that really goes towards the coordinators. So there's not usually additional project funding. Understandably, that makes it difficult to push some of these, these things forward. So we do cite that as, as a bit of a flip side to what's been achieved and an opportunity where we could perhaps do that more. Now another, another great graphic for you here. Uh, when we talk about an outcome around promotion and coordinated consistent planning, needs, you know, identification of needs and service delivery, we heard back very strongly that, that LIPS are felt to have contributed very positively to the better planning and coordination of settlement and mainstream activities in most communities. Very high percentage got back to us and saying they felt that the LIP was having an impact there and the coordinators went on to even tell us that uh, they felt this kind of coordination was central to success. And you can see on, on the, the, the pies, 61% on, on one of them talk about a strong and moderate impact on settlement service coordination and it's about the same around 60% on the impact of mainstream service coordination. So bringing, being able to bring people together was highly rated and, and felt as a crucial piece. So again, I would call that a very positive finding. <clears throat> of course, now when we, we turn our eyes to uh, cultural sensitivity and you think about the newcomer vulnerable populations and being in a new country, definitely an important impact to try to, try to get at it is promotion of that culturally competent service delivery. And on, on this front, the evaluation was able to show that substantial progress has been made in this area in terms of developing practices and a recognition of cultural competence for service providers. And you can see a couple, again, a couple numbers here that say about 62% told us they were able to report improvements in cultural competence in their mainstream uh, service providers. 56% reported that they had developed some kind of innovative approach or practice. And, and again, you've got a couple of great examples. Uh, and I'm sure there's many, many more. We just wanted to highlight a couple before we give you a flavor. But it, it is taking place, and I think that helps with, with the integration process and one that we would urge people to continue to look out for. Oopsies. Thank you. Now, this is, this is one of the, the outcomes that always got me thinking that when we started this project. A lot of that, I feel, is the previous stuff is... Um, almost administrative and set up and building the infrastructure to be successful. But what are our client impacts and how do you, you get at that? And, and I'll be back later this afternoon with a couple, of our a couple other panelists to speak on this, our views on how do we get at measuring welcoming community outcomes and impacts. And one of the ways that we thought was important to look at was in terms of accessibility and seamlessness of service for clients. And we had a few questions around that research questions. I think the, the goal would be to have a, a newcomer that arrives and does, doesn't know, but doesn't what, who's providing what, you know, money and services of what stripe or color are not that important to a newcomer. I think it's, can I get what I need? Do I have the ability to reach the services, get referrals and so forth in broad terms? So accessibility of services was something we tried to look at. And we assessed this through our service provider uh, interviews, focus groups that were out in the field, and it was reported back to us that by and large, people were satisfied with the degree to which services were accessible. But of course, those newcomers we spoke to couldn't necessarily pin that on, on a lip, but is that necessarily a bad thing? I would leave you to ponder that. I, I think that's a good news story here in terms of this finding. And nobody that we talked to in our focus groups, and as I said, we went around the country, different types of people, and nobody could say that they, there was a gap in, in their service or, or their early integration and they, they were getting what they need, they knew who to speak to and so forth. So again, a, a very positive finding. Now taking a look on the money side of things and leveraging diverse sources of funding, so tying this back to another theory of change outcome that was originally put as what LIPS were trying to achieve was finding us, I think, with sustainable and diverse sets of funding. And this has proved to be a bit more challenging. As the years have progressed, sustainable sources of funding for LIPS have not been there. I mean, it was great to hear that the, the person, I think, from Vernon just mentioned that. I, I was like, wow, you, you got your, your hands on a great bit of money to do great things. So I think that, that that's excellent. And, but we did hear, by and large, that this is a, is a bit of a challenge for folks uh, for various reasons in terms of lack of ability to have the capacity to put forward propositions, uh, reach, uh, 
funding and reach out to other funders, not just federally. So that, that was noted definitely as a challenge. And you can see where some of the different funding comes from in, in one of the graphics. There, there are other sources, but IRCC is not the only one. And what are the knock-on effects of this uncertainty was the ability to push forward some of those plans and projects, and we had heard that without the sustainable or, or ability to confirm funding that it was hard to push those things and contribute to the strategic plans without the necessary backing of resources. <coughs> Now, taking a look at a relevance question, and this is something we always ask in our evaluation community at the federal level, and it's uh, what's the continued need, continued relevance of a program pilot or a project? Yeah, this is a kind of a value for money question. These are the big level things that, that the, the ministry wants to know about is, is where are we getting the bang for a buck? And, and there, there's a loud, you know, positive sign here that there is some need for this kind of uh, place-based initiative, partnerships, merging together services and diverse partners, you know, be it a LIP or be it some other form, I think bring that together, the, the, the relevance is clear, there's a continued need, there's no question about that. And then we went on to ask about what would happen if there wasn't a LIP in place and you can see some of the answers here in, in terms of strategic planning might be lacking if there was not a LIP. <coughs> uh, ability to conduct and plan research might not be there, there would be a lack of coordination, Partners wouldn't necessarily talk to each other or meet regularly. So all sorts of gaps start to emerge when you say, what would happen if we didn't have a LIP? So all strong arguments to say there is a continued need, and, and I think our, our finding will really support that. Um, and, and you can see some of the mo most cited reasons. So we, we started you know, a bit with the counterfactual there, as I said, and what would happen if there was no LIP. But the reasons why come out quite strongly. You know, getting newcomer issues to the forefront, absolutely crucial. Uh, getting the right uh, you know, things on the policy agenda, making mainstream services aware to newcomers, things like that, all these key things that LIPS do and accomplish. So all that supports the continued need for LIPS and a sort of geography-based partnership model. <clears throat> In summary, these are just preliminary conclusions and it's, it's a working draft and just some thoughts were, were sort of put together here. But if you think about LIPS and how would I summarize this, th this is it. it, it it's really a highly valued approach, a partnership approach has really got some benefits there. And the many achievements have been made. I think, you know, again, you should pat yourselves on the back uh, for what you've been able to accomplish. I think there's still more to do with some hurdles to overcome. But I think it's on the right path and delivering benefits both from a, a, an administrative joining of services perspective to a clients as well. When you hear that there are no gaps supported by clients, that's very encouraging in terms of what you're able to deliver. So many tools have been developed and citing those as best practices. My little plug here would be to continue to share these at events like this and see if you can build that capacity across the board and I'm sure you'll do that throughout the rest of the day and, and the conference. We do cite very clearly here that there, there's a need for a, a consideration of funding and how the department would like to proceed with, with LIPS and moving forward. I, I think we have to do a bit of a rethink, if I can say that, and, and I leave that to my policy colleagues with whom we'll work very closely on and uh, understanding these findings and drilling into the data, but there is something there that needs to be assessed. Um, and, and finally, LIPS no doubt working well in, in many places, uh, almost all of them. The question we're posing to the department as an evaluation group is, is the structure of a LIP and the governance requirements and almost the terms and conditions an absolute requirement in every case? As somebody said just before I walked, or as I walked in, context is important. There's not one shape fits all, one size fits all. Different size communities, different clientele, different capacities, funding levels, all those things. So maybe having a council is not always necessary, but having a funded coordinator role to oversee things might be that. Or are there different models we're not thinking of? And this is where I might flip that back to the community in the next little while as we finish this up. And, or you could engage with our policy colleagues and, and bring forward some thoughts. I, I think the lip, there is a need, but is it a, a full-blown lip as we're saying? It, uh, maybe that, that bears some thinking. So that is, that is where we're at in terms of our, our key findings. And I've tried to breeze through that so we can have some discussion time. Just to let you know next steps <coughs> for us. Geez, that slide looks a little blank, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> we're doing much more, I promise. Uh, but as I said, we're going to finalize the analysis, really work on our data a little bit, and this will be folded into the bigger settlement evaluation. So, and I'll give you some highlights on that if you, if you give me a few minutes right after this. Um, 
We're going to work on that and see what does it mean and bring that forward to senior management. We're going to start sharing this across the department a little more. And this, this will feature as a, a subcomponent of the, the bigger settlement program evaluation as we try to wrestle those results to the ground and get a result story out of it. Uh, so a little bit more to do there and of course engage with our policy program and ops colleagues on how to move forward based on our findings and what we think are some of the gaps. I, I can proudly say that we've already been able to review this with those guys and gals and uh, they are aware, they acknowledge, you know, the department is accepting the findings basically and would like to find a way to move forward so work is slowly getting underway so we'll continue to work with them. So should I do an overview of the settlement evaluation that might be interesting to people and then take all sorts of questions? Um, yeah? Great, let's do that. So switching gears for a second. And you know, this, is our, this is our big ticket evaluation. Um, you know, big funding, big grant and contribution program in the department and at the top of, of ministers, senior management's mind is what are we getting for our, our big investment in settlement, integration, short and long term is key. So we've been working on planning and rolling out this evaluation for about the last 18 months and we are midstream in terms of data collection right now. Uh, so when you think of settlement, you're thinking about language, training and instruction, employment related services, information and orientation, community connections and all, all those other streams of integration services. So it's quite a beast to try to wrestle to the ground in terms of reporting on outcomes and I don't think you're going to see a, a high level settlement works great or, or kind of Results story. This is going to be by piece. That's one of the reasons we were trying to unpack it and say, yeah, here's what we found on LIPS. Here's what we're going to find on RIFs. Here's what language training and instruction is doing. And here's what support services is doing. So look, look forward to that in the future. Our target for completing the settlement evaluation is March 2017. Um, as I noted here, a lot of our lines of evidence are underway or, or slowly being concluded. A couple yet to get off the ground. The cornerstone for us is our settlement client outcome survey. And I'll highlight that in the next couple of slides for you. Uh, that is really going to give us a richness of information we've never had before. And then we're doing some of our standard approaches like the key document review and contextualization of, of the settlement environment and recognizing that there have been factors that have led to settlement. You think of bringing back BC and Manitoba services, for example, when they were repatriated and so forth. Uh, we are doing that case study in RIFs, as I noted. Another really important one, I think, is key for folks is settlement support services and what a child minding interpretation, translation, transportation, those enabling functions that let people access settlement services. We really haven't shone a light on that yet in the department so we're, we're very excited to have a case study on that and that's underway. We should be able to wrap that up before Christmas I understand and I've seen some preliminary things there but it, it really is a key one that department wants to know about that kind of funding that goes towards that. Are we giving people the ability to benefit from settlement services? Um, so we do have some a survey of SPOs that we're just developing going to be launched in the new year and we are going to do our usual key stakeholder interviews. So take a moment here uh, and for those who are more you know, survey or research oriented this might, might excite you a little bit. Uh, for the first time we've been able to develop a, a settlement client outcome survey that we spent about a year doing internally to be the, the, the linchpin of our, our evaluation. And, and by that I mean it's not just a typical satisfaction survey. We have built this to be fairly complex in that it links with settlement service usage data. So those who know iCare, uh, if you've obtained a service, we've gone out to try to survey you to see how you've been able to take what you've got from IRCC federally funded services and put that into action in your life. Do you have, did you gain increased uh, increase knowledge, awareness, referrals? Were you able to use your language skills that you've obtained in your day-to-day -day life at your, your parent-teacher interviews, in your day-to-day -day activities at, at the bank? Were you able to get employment-related services to help you tap into the labor market and so forth? So moving from awareness to knowledge to use to impact, and this is something we plan to roll out year over year uh, now in a cross-sectional way rather than longitudinal. So, this is groundbreaking for us. It might not sound that, that major, but uh, you know, we're talking about outcomes now. And then when we're able to link that to the client services received and do some, some fancy analysis and, and regression and things like that to isolate what is working and not working, this is going to be just tremendously powerful and rich. And we look forward to sharing those results when we can. Uh, just to note for you here how we went about it, this was issued, this survey, to a huge number, must have been near. 70, 80,000 settlement clients, maybe more, I could be misspeaking. And we got a, a huge response rate of about 16,000, which is enormous for us. 
Uh, so we really feel there's a depth of information we can tap into and tell the settlement story. We launched it in eight languages, as you can see there, so a good representation of newcomers, uh, and that, that took some work to do. And then for underrepresented groups, after our first wave, we went out and hit them with a phone survey. So we really feel there's a balance of who is in our sample. You know, the certain types of vulnerable populations, elders and so forth, all people we want to get their perspectives as well. <coughs> so just to give you a little flavor of what the survey respondents look like to date, and I just think this is important because it, it does point to a fact we have something fairly representative, I would say, to date, and that we'll be able to work with. You know, 16,000 responses, huge for us. Interesting, if you look at the modes and, and well, who, how they responded. But you can see we got a good cross-section, permanent residents, the gender balance, how it worked out for our respondents, what classes they came from. Again, cutting, cutting a swath across the department's categories and newcomers. And I think that a little typo at the bottom, by the way, that should say 15% to BC, not 75. Sorry, BC folks. Um, there. So again, this is a little sample of what's happening in, in our survey which we, we look forward to analyzing. It's going to be this massive data set that we can use for years in the department and, and to share with our partners. Uh, next steps on this one is, is completing that analysis, merging those data sets, no small task, and then doing that analysis and unpacking what are the factors and determinants of success, uh, moving from services received to the demographic profile of clients. So not only what services, how do they contribute to their outcomes, the client outcomes, but to uh, their profile, their country of origin, their educational background. We're merging all that in, in a way that's never been done before. So it, it just, you know, it, it, it's going to be really something yielding some results. And then, of course, work that into our, our results and try to tell a story out of that. So with that, how are we doing for time? Not bad. I'll take a pause and happy to take questions, comments, concerns, love letters, hate mail. <laughs>